Hi, thanks for joining me. Today I'm going to be solving a fun complex number problem. We have a set S, uh, which is a subset of the complex numbers raised to the star. So this basically means all the complex numbers except without zero. So S is simply a set of non-zero complex numbers. And we have that the cardinality of S is just N, where N is a natural number, which is at least two. So S is a finite set with cardinality at least two. And then we, S also has the property that for any two numbers in S, so A and B, for any A and B in S, we have that the product of A and B is also in S. So take any two elements in S, and they could be the same element, multiply them together, and you're also going to get another element in S. We want to find the sum of the elements in S, so the sum of X and S of X. Okay, so if you want to have a go at this problem, pause the video now and give it a go for yourself, and I'm going to jump straight into a solution. <laughs> Okay, so this video is actually going to be rather short because the solution to this is pretty simple. Firstly, let's label the set or label the elements in the set S, S1, S2, and so on, all the way up to Sn. So we have S just equals this guy here. The next thing we're going to do is use one of the properties of S to rewrite S in a different way. So the property we're going to be using is that if you take any two elements in S and multiply them together, you're going to get another element in S. So that tells us that, you know, if we look at S1, we know that S1 times Si is going to be in S and that holds for all i from 1 all the way up to n. Okay, and that's just one of the properties of uh, the set S. So in particular, notice that S1 times Si is going to be in S and S1 times say Sj is also going to be in S. But notice that if i and j are distinct, so if i does not equal j, then we have the S1 Si cannot equal S1, Sj. And the reason for that is because we know each of the Si's are non-zero. So that means if, you know, this guy holds, suppose they were equal, then we could cancel the S1's from both sides. And then we get the Si equals Sj, which because they're all distinct means that I would equal J, which contradicts this guy here. So we know that S1 times Si must be distinct from S1 multiplied by Sj when I and J are distinct. Okay, but then that means that if I multiply each of the elements in this guy here by S1, I'm going to get a set with n elements in. So in other words, when I multiply each of these guys by S1, I know it's going to be an S, and I know I'm going to produce a set with n elements in, but I know S has n elements, hence it must be S. So S also is equal to S1 squared, S1 times S2, S1 times S3, and so on, all the way up to S1 times Sn, like so. Okay, so we have S written in this form here, and S also written in this form here. Now, that's not to say that S1 squared is S1, and S1, S2 is the same as S2. Of course, that would be true if S1 was 1, but we don't know that. But what we do know is if we take all of these terms here and add them up, we're going to get the same thing as if we add all the terms up in that guy there. So if I go ahead and do that, so if I add up all these terms here, I'm going to get an S1 squared plus S1, S2, plus so on, all the way up to S1, Sn. And that's going to equal S1 plus S2 plus so on, all the way up to Sn. Okay, but then of course, every, you know, on this left-hand side, I can fa factor out an S1. So I'm left with S1 plus S2 plus so on, all the way up to Sn. So this thing here is simply S1 and S1 plus S2 plus so on, all the way up to Sn. But then I've got this guy on this side and this guy on this side. So I can bring everything onto one side and simply get the S1 minus 1 times S1 plus S2 plus so on, all the way up to Sn, this guy here equals 0. Now, we're, we have S1 plus S2 plus all the way up to Sn, which is kind of what we want to do. We want to find the sum of the elements in S, and it seems like this guy here is going to be 0, provided we can cancel this thing from both sides. Now, the issue is, if, if S1 equals 1, then we can't just you know cancel this from both sides because obviously this will be non-zero. If S1 isn't one, then that's fine. Then of course we can cancel uh, this from both sides and we'll get the S1 plus S2 plus so on all the way up to Sn is equal to zero. But remember that S1 was just kind of arbitrarily chosen. I can repeat this exact same argument except replacing all the S1s with the S2s or the S1s with the S3s or any of the other Si's I want. It doesn't matter. So if S1 is equal to one, then what we can do is just repeat the exact same argument but instead replaces S1 here with, say, an S2. And now because we know that each of them are distinct, and if S1 was equal to 1, in particular, that means that S2 is not equal to 1. So we have this equation here, then we can go ahead and cancel by this thing here, 
and we get that S1 plus S2 plus so on, all the way up to Sn, is equal to zero. So we found the sum of the elements in our set, and that's always going to be equal to zero. And notice, I guess, one thing in particular is because n is at least two, that means there's always two distinct elements, or at least two elements in the set, so we can always change the S1 to some other Si, and if S1 does equal one, then we know that all the others won't equal one, so we can just pick any of the others, plug it into this guy here, cancel this from both sides, and we get the sum of the elements is equal to zero, and that solves our problem. Anyway, I hope that has all made sense, and I hope you have enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. Have a great day.